first of all, may I say that uh, I've listened to the opening addresses at many, uh, on many occasions in many different parts of the world. And I think from the beginning, from the characterization of the purpose of this winter school by Ivana, through the presentations by the mayor who was marvelously in a certain sense flanked by a screen on which God is implored to hear us. I cannot think of a more important message at this particular moment through the absolutely first-rate presentations of Professor Italia and then by Ferenc raising central issues of critical importance at this time. I think this has been one of the most remarkable frames of a set of discussions at an inflection point of history that any of us could have been privileged to hear. I'm going to try and unpack a few of those dimensions in ways that I hope will help your discussions over the next several days. I'm not offering answers. Ferenc was not sure that he had answers. I know I don't. I do know the nature of the challenges and I can only characterize them in the way in which I can see them and understand them. But I'm going to focus preeminently on that, on the challenges that we need urgently, and I would argue desperately, to engage in critical reflection, in a search for truths, in an understanding, as Professor Italia said, that the reification, the objectification of truth is justice. And in a way that restores out of this cacophony of monologues, what Ferenc called for in the context of a restoration of dialogue. So that is the, the purpose of the few slides I'm going to share with you. First of all, it's very easy under these circumstances to be entirely pessimistic. And I would only argue that over the last two centuries, life has got better for the vast majority of people on the earth. Extreme poverty has been reduced. Basic education has increased. Literacy as a result has risen. Child mortality has fallen significantly. Vaccination against infectious diseases has improved appreciably and even democracy has spread markedly across the world. If one reduces the totality of our challenges to simple propositions, I'd suggest to you for consideration that there are really five. The first is we have to ensure that economic growth is both environmentally and socially sustainable. And what I mean by socially sustainable is equitable and therefore in the interests of societies at large. I would argue that environmental sustainability is a function of intergenerational equity. We are not entitled to exploit the natural resources that we have inherited in our generations at the expense of those that follow. Secondly, recognizing the scale of the challenges that we face in terms of poverty and inequality, we need a proper lens. And I'm suggesting that of equity, or once again, to pick up on what Professor Italia said, justice as a reference point for the need to address poverty and inequality. Thirdly, we have to recognize that national security and particularly defense is not, cannot be, and should not be a ring-fenced area. The purpose of security is to reduce vulnerability. And the reduction of vulnerability at different scales, at the individual human scale, the community scale, the national scale, the regional and global scales, is the purpose of the pursuit of security. And our security policies ought to be directed to that end. To do those three things, we need to share norms, including what is known at international law as the concept of jus cogens, law that must be respected because of its transcendent quality and values that enable global coexistence on a single planet. 
but we must do that while respecting and reconciling cultural differences to enable us to coexist without forcing one truth on everyone. Lastly, in order to give effect to all of that, we have to invest significantly in improving the quality of transnational governance and our global institutions. I think once again, Ferenc's point on the complete absence from the scene of the United Nations and the Secretary General, even the Security Council, during the course of the past several weeks has been one of the scariest elements of the failure of collective action at transnational scales. I'm going to offer you a synthetic view of our current status, which we'll try and unpack. But I think it's fair to say that the interplay between long range geoeconomic trends, geopolitical tensions of various sorts, including that that we see playing out in Eurasia at present, and social inequality of nearly unprecedented scale, which is being exacerbated by what is often called a fourth industrial revolution, but what is in truth a radical biodigital transformation of the technological landscape. The interplay between those elements is fracturing national societies, weakening representative democracy, and vitiating imperative collective action on a wide range of global challenges, including climate, oceans, biodiversity, health, and a range of conventional and unconventional security threats. We are truthfully at an inflection point. There have been periods in history when we have been placed perhaps more dangerously between survival and disaster, but this is a particularly remarkable one. And it's incumbent on all of us, I think, to recognize precisely how dangerous the moment is. What has happened in respect of the collective response to SARS-CoV-2 in the context of COVID-19 in terms of the availability of vaccines is a perfect example of this. Pfizer has recorded the highest profit ever recorded by a pharmaceutical company in the course of its last financial year. And despite that, large portions of the world, needless to say the poorest parts, will not be able to achieve widespread vaccination coverage before 2023. This is an horrendous idea. It reflects absolutely no respect for human dignity. It is utterly inequitable. It displays no sense of justice. And it's economically stupid because the cost of declining trade and economic activity will be borne disproportionately by the wealthier countries. So it's inequitable, unjust, and economically stupid. We can see it in respect of the current circumstance in terms of recovery. The COVID-19 pandemic had a gigantic impact. The picture on the left is from the IMF's report of June of 2020. Globally, in terms of the advanced economies and in terms of emerging markets and developing economies. But the advanced economies had large fiscal and resources and monetary capacity to be able to address the social challenges on a much larger scale. The world's billionaires increased their fortunes highly significantly in the course of the past two years. And the IMF reported in World Economic Outbrook in January 2022, that the recovery will be massively divergent with the low income developing countries suffering most, emerging markets and developing countries suffering significantly and the advanced economy is doing rather well. The idea that we can undertake collective action in response to global challenges was not only weakened by the global financial crisis between 2008 and 2014, but has once again been staggeringly impacted 
by our inability to address the challenges associated with this pandemic. Now, hybrid risk is a part of what you are going to interrogate. And therefore, I'm just going to show you a few, what I would describe as linear pictures of the way in which we look at risk under present circumstances. It's not actually very helpful. But here, nonetheless, is the World Economic Forum's Global Risks Report for 2022, which lists the top 10 global risks by severity, estimated by the fairly remarkable group of really smart people that the forum has in the global risk network over the next 10 years. Climate action failure, extreme weather, biodiversity loss, erosion of social cohesion, livelihood crises, infectious diseases, human environmental damage, natural resource crises, debt crises, and geoeconomic confrontation are what this fairly remarkable group of very smart people decided with the largest risks by severity over the next 10 years. I'm sure immediately you'll see the overlap between climate action failure, extreme weather and biodiversity loss. I'm sure you'll see the overlap between social cohesion, erosion, livelihood crises. I'm sure you'll see the overlap between natural resource crises and human environmental damage. And you'll notice there's absolutely nothing on geopolitics. So the way in which we look at these questions isn't very sophisticated. On the 21st of January, the Secretary General of the United Nations did speak to what he saw as a five alarm global fire. A five alarm global fire means the fire is global in scope and it's of extreme potential damage. His first alarm was COVID-19, he said it must be top of the agenda at present, but it's not a cover to restrict civil space and freedoms. He said our actions must be grounded in science and common sense and pointed out that rich nations vaccination rates were seven times those in Africa. He used remarkable words for an international civil servant. Distribution is scandalously unequal. The second alarm was the necessity of reforming global finance. And here he was even more outspoken. He said, the global financial system is morally bankrupt. It favors the rich and punishes the poor. He went on to say, the divergence is systemic, the recipe for instability, crisis and forced migration. And these imbalances are not incidental, they are a feature of the global financial system. He then spoke of the climate emergency and said, we need an emergency mode to address the climate crisis. He said, the obvious, we're far off track on limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels and called for no new coal plants and no oil and gas exploration. He suggested that global emissions must be reduced by 45% by 2030 if we are to reach carbon neutrality by 2050 and said a green transition was essential. He also pointed out that rich countries must deliver 100 billion to developing countries for adaptation purposes, and action on adaptation was urgent to get the finance to developing countries on time. Let me simply note that I don't think there's anyone in the world who's looked at the numbers realistically, who believes that 100 billion is going to make a dent in what is required for purposes of adaptation. And there is once again an horrendous injustice in the reality that countries that have contributed least to carbon and methane stocks in the atmosphere over the past two centuries since the Industrial Revolution are those who are poised to suffer most as a consequence of what industri the industrial world has done. His fourth alarm was on technology and cyberspace. He said there are extraordinary possibilities, but growing digital chaos is benefiting the most destructive forces and denying opportunities to ordinary people. One of the many things that quite a lot of us do is to sit on a series of panels related to artificial intelligence and inequality, and in the context of that, seeking to define what equitable development of technological breakthroughs would involve. 
the Secretary General has proposed a global digital compact and a global code of contact to end the war on science and promote integrity and in public information, ban lethal autonomous weapons and cross governance frameworks for biotechnology and neurotechnology. And the fifth alarm, the last was on peace and security. He noted that the world now faces the highest number of violent conflicts since 1945 and said a little emotionally, this world is too small for so many hotspots. Geopolitical divides must be managed to avoid chaos. We need to maximize cooperation while establishing robust mechanisms to avoid escalation. This is Ferenc's need for the restoration of dialogue and the quieting of excessive monologues. So we're on the edge of the abyss. If one takes the Secretary General remotely seriously, one has to recognize that the conflation of these different elements, not their linear existence independently of one another, but the conflation of these elements is exceptionally dangerous. And that brings us to this issue of the challenge of complexity. Connectivity before COVID-19 in respect of flights, in respect of internet connectivity exacerbated or extended considerably during the pandemic, have contributed to deeper realization of the reality of the fact that humanity, human society in the earth system, in the biosphere, if you will, is a complex adaptive system. To understand the meaning of that, we have to unpack just a few elements of it in the simplest possible terms. Complex systems have got particular characteristics. There are many strongly interdependent variables. Each of those variables contributes towards observed outputs, but understanding how the outputs occur is extremely difficult in a complex system because there's no linearity within the system itself. There are feedback loops throughout the system where a change in any variable either results in amplification or the dampening of the change. Much of what happened in the financial crisis was a function of believing that dispersal of risk would be a significant dampening effect. Well, it was up to a point until it became a significant exacerbator of the spread of contagion through the system, allowing a crisis in the subprime housing market in the United States to bring down the global economy. The reality of complex systems is that they have a propensity for chaotic behavior. There's extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. There's fractal geometry and self-organizing criticality. Now, what that means simply is that you can't have one size fits all, whether it's for economic growth, sustainable development, COP27 in Cairo or 28 in Abu Dhabi, none of these work on a one size fits all basis because the sensitivity to initial conditions in terms of one set of solutions will produce completely different outcomes in different circumstances. And then, and that's the reason for my man standing on the edge of the abyss and for that ball, that sphere circling in space on the edge of an inflection point, there are multiple metastable states in all complex systems and things shift radically from one state to another at inflection points. Finally, Anyone who thinks that there is a Gaussian distribution of outputs, a random walk, a reversion to the mean in complex systems simply doesn't understand what they mean. And complex adaptive systems, which as I've suggested is a function of human society in the biosphere, are systems that adapt in and evolve with their changing environments. There's no separation between the system and the environment. Systems are closely linked with other related systems comprising an ecosystem and changes the co-evolution of all the related systems, not adaptation to a separate environment. Dan Brooks, who's going to talk to you later in respect of several of these issues will unpack this in much greater detail. 
Now, the implications for policy in respect of all of this are quite simple. There's a huge mismatch between the complexity of the systems in which we're embedded and our limited capacity to understand their workings. That makes it very difficult to get policy right. Our understanding and responses are limited by our own rigid reductionist mental models, which tend to assumptions of monocausality or irrational constructs like the efficient market hypothesis and the existence of rational economic actors. Anyone who knows anything about humans knows that we're not very rational. We respond emotionally, angrily, enthusiastically, out of all sorts of biological pressures at different points in time. And therefore, an entire system premised on the notion of rational action is clearly defective in every conceivable sense. But on top of that, the policies that we enact play out in a dynamic, complex environment and therefore lead to unintended consequences. As we make policy, tremendous amounts of compromises and trade-offs are intrinsic in this whole process because that's how things get through parliaments and congresses. And even well-conceived policies often give rise to perverse effects and that breeds public cynicism, distrust and resistance. And we've seen plenty of it. We can see more of it now, even in Canada, with remarkable blockages by truckers disrupting economic movement into the United States. So how do we think about this issue? What is really happening? How do we infuse our understanding of how the world works with an understanding of the workings of complex systems? There are a couple of things we sort of think we know. We think population growth in respect of the median path is likely to go up to about 9.3 billion on the median path by 2050. We think that urbanization will inevitably continue to accelerate. Dan will have something else to say about that in due course. But we think it will inevitably accelerate with an increase of roughly 2.5 billion urban dwellers between 2020 and 2050, 90% of whom will be in Asia and Africa. We think that the world is getting older, not least because of better medicine, improved vaccination capability, lower infant mortality, maternal mortality, and child mortality. And as a consequence, we think that we will get to 60 persons of 60 plus years of age, rising to about 21% of the total population by 2050. That poses huge challenges because we will have four generations seeking economic opportunities simultaneously over the course of the next 30 years. We've never done that before. We have no experience, we have no models, we have no intrinsic idea how to tackle that. And then this biodigital revolution that I've spoken of already is going to be transformative and disruptive of society, of the economy, of political systems with entirely unpredictable impacts. So what do we think we know? The brain is there because this is merely a conceptualization. We think the center of economic gravity is going to continue shifting from the Atlantic toward the Indo-Pacific. There's plenty of evidence to that. We've seen over the course of the past six or seven years, higher returns to capital and knowledge and falling returns to labor. It's certainly a disruptive element under present circumstances and it's going to be exacerbated by this biodigital revolution of disruptive congruent technologies. That is producing jobless growth and social dislocation. All of that necessarily weakens representative democracy because the purpose of a government is to enhance the welfare of the citizens who voted it into power. If they can't, by definition, it is not trusted. The geoeconomic trends and this shift in respect of the technological landscape has brought about a return of geopolitics. And there are three areas in which this has been apparent now for over a decade. The first has been from the Mediterranean extending out into Central Asia through the Arab or if you will, Muslim world. 
The second has been in the Indo-Pacific, but particularly at the interface of the South China Sea and the East China Sea, and in the Himalayas along the line of actual control between India and China. And the third has been in the vicinity of what is often known as the Russian near abroad, for the reasons that have already been touched on and that I'll say a little bit about in a moment. And those factors have driven an extraordinary degree of forced migration over the course of the past decade and seem likely to bring about yet more. Against that, this issue of humanity, which has now reached a point where its impacts on the biosphere or the Earth system have exceeded the restraining impact of the Earth system on humanity. And the disruption that is occurring in that particular space suggests at the moment that we will see very unpleasant feedback loops. This is another way to think about it, and I've got the reference on the left-hand side. By the way, all of these slides will be available to you, as well as some others for additional context after I've finished waffling. But the, the reference that unpacks this in some greater degree uh, is on the left-hand side, and you can get access to the argumentation behind it with no difficulty. Broadly speaking, the only thing that has changed in the course of the last two years is that US power projection capability has been reduced significantly, which introduces another element of uncertainty for good or for ill into the system at large. And what used to be described in the aftermath of the implosion of the Soviet Union in 1991 as the rules-based international order has been disrupted highly significantly with several competitive attempts to restructure it in a variety of different ways. The other elements are all the same as those that I've discussed. Now, what one needs to understand is that these interact. So as we've already seen, the revival of geopolitics engenders migratory flows. Increasing returns to capital, falling returns to labor, together with the disruptive new congruent technologies, increases jobless growth. The weakening of representative democracy is driven appreciably by migratory flows. We've seen tensions in Central Europe. We've seen Brexit in the context of the European Union. And obviously, the revival of geopolitics, on top of everything else that is happening within the Earth system, is likely to bring about further significant disruptions of sustainability, even as the adaptation challenges in different parts of the world, think about South Asia and Africa as perfect examples, are going to bring about further migratory flows and hence geopolitical disruptions in other parts of the world. So all of those factors interrelate with one another and play out in complex ways. When we model this, we think we can draw certain basic conclusions in the short term. The drivers are this bio-digital revolution and what is occurring in the biosphere as a consequence of increased human activity. And by that, I mean growth in population, urbanization, increased consumption, increased manufacturing, increased transportation, and increased waste. The pivotal factor in respect of all of this is the return or the revival of geopolitics. And the reason why that's problematical is we might have a better chance of effective collective action if these tensions were not endemic in the system. But as those tensions rise in the system, it becomes more and more difficult to enable collective action at transnational scale to address the primary challenges. The outcomes are quite clear. The weakening of representative democracy, jobless growth, migratory flows, and increasing returns to capital and falling returns to labor. And oh boy, have we seen that in the course of the past two years. Just have a look at the increase in net wealth of the class of billionaires. At the moment, the marginal trend in all of this is the shift in the economic center of gravity, 
But if that translates, as it seems likely to do in the last three weeks, if that shifts into geopolitical tensions between China and the United States, it will exacerbate and bring to a rapid inflection point the entire system. So what have we got? When you think about how systems function, the economy, the society, and the polity have to be broadly symmetrical. So we have a highly integrated global economy, technological integration, global financial institutions, and global supply chains. But we have fractured global societies. And in the course of the past several years, we've seen a resurgence of nationalism, we've seen an increase in sectarianism, and we've seen a rise in interstate conflict. And as Ferenc remarked in respect of the United Nations right at the beginning, the truth is the polity has proved to be gravely lacking. The United Nations has not been able to address the challenges associated with this in any meaningful way. And although the International Monetary Fund led by Kristalina Georgieva has made a fairly remarkable effort to be able to ensure that the recovery from COVID is addressed in a more systemic and efficient way than the recovery from the global financial crisis, the truth is that the G20 finance ministers have not responded adequately to the challenges put before them by the managing director of the IMF. The World Trade Organization is still deadlocked on multiple levels. The International Court of Justice is scarcely operating and the International Criminal Court is riven by dissent. Now, there's nothing surprising that in those circumstances, something else starts happening. These post-World War II institutions whose deficiencies we've identified have been challenged meaningfully by the rising power, China. China doesn't wish to displace the United Nations or the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank or the WTO, but it doesn't feel that it has been given a fair shake within those institutions and as a consequence has created a number of its own institutions to address its own needs and is not able, we have not been able, let me put it that way, to find a balance between the existing institutions and the emergent institutions in this regard. And as the past several weeks have demonstrated, but let me add, I prepared this slide for the first time nearly five years ago, as the last few weeks have indicated, Mr. Putin's determination to achieve three objectives, maintain maintenance of nuclear parity with the United States, a significant capacity for power projection on the part of the Russian Federation, and control of the near abroad have become an element which is, has become quite disruptive in respect of the underlying assumptions for good or for ill, according to which the world has been managed in geopolitical terms over the course of the past three decades. There is the shift in the balance of power. Now the purpose in showing you this is not to say this is right and that's wrong, or this is good and that's bad. That's not my function. My function is to cause you to ask the sort of questions that Ferenc was suggesting at the beginning. But if you look at that, recognizing that the only place that any head of state or head of government can see the world from is his own capital, then you can see that the world has changed radically from the perspective of Moscow. When we look at what we have seen play out in the last week, that is the picture that all of us who rely appreciably on Western media have seen in terms of prepositioning of Russian forces relative to Ukraine. And that is the picture that Moscow is looking at. So when you have perspectives of reality that are that divergent, the risk of miscalculation 
increases radically. And that is an appreciable part of what we've been seeing over the course of the past several weeks. Javier Sulana is an interesting chap. He's been former High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy at the European Union, Secretary General of NATO and Foreign Minister of Spain. He recovered last year, thank goodness, from a rather nasty bout of COVID and uh, is back on his feet writing quite a lot at the moment. He did an article in Project Syndicate on the 21st of January called Ukraine and the Fundamentals of European Security. The reason I'm highlighting this one among many, many others that have been written over the course of the past several weeks is simply because nobody could accuse Javier Solana of wishing to be an apologist for Mr. Putin. But look at what he said. He cited firstly Putin's rather remarkable speech in 2007 at the Munich Security Conference. Those of you who have seen Sorry, we, we seem to have somebody unmuted with background noise then. Um, he cited the Munich Security Conference of 2007 speech where Putin spelled out in very, very clear words, again, for good or for ill, the unipolar model is not only un unacceptable, he meant to Russia, but also impossible in today's world. He hasn't changed his position since 2007. He actually held that position in 2001. Solana makes the very interesting point that Russian foreign policy is based on a territorial conception of power. And anyone who remembers the Napoleonic Wars, anyone who remembers Hitler's decision to send armor all the way to Stalingrad will understand why that would be. That great European plane is remarkably flat. And Solana goes on to say the progressive reduction of Russia's territorial buffer formed by countries over which it exerted powerful influence or outright control left the Kremlin feeling cornered. Against this backdrop, the prospect of losing Ukraine is even more unacceptable than a unipolar world order, which explains Russia's massive deployment of troops along the country's long border. Russia does not seem poised to attempt to annex all of Ukraine. Nonetheless, the Kremlin is clearly committed to keeping Ukraine within its sphere of influence. Now, let me express a personal point of view very quickly. I do not believe that any solution to the present crisis can be allowed to reward military aggression or the sort of behavior that we saw in Georgia in 2008 or in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine in 2014. So please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that what has happened is a completely unstable circumstance has been allowed to develop inter alia as a result of that unipolar structure. These are two elements which if one speaks to Russian strategists at present, are the biggest dangers in the present circumstance seen from the perspective of Moscow, but also as a risk of escalation into outright conflict. They're known as ages ashore. They are present in Romania and in Poland. The Polish deployment will only be operational by the end of 2022. The deck house is in place. The R Romanian facility has been in operation since 2016. The reason for the introduction of these was the cancellation at the beginning of the present century of the anti-ballistic missile treaty, which had been concluded in 1972. The reason that George W. Bush elected to cancel the anti-ballistic missile treaty to have the United States withdraw from it was because of a potential nuclear threat from Iran. These Aegis Ashore deployments were developed for the purpose of protection against Iranian missiles, but the Russians never believed that for one second. And so as a consequence of that, 
we have a situation where in addition to everything else, Moscow has reached the conclusion that the nuclear balance is being fundamentally disturbed by what is being undertaken in this regard. And it is reading what is occurring in the context of NATO within that framework as well. Remember those three points that I spoke of in terms of Putin's own mindset. So the truth is that the challenge, the solution, the only way forward in respect of European security is reconceptualization of the security architecture. If we don't succeed in doing that, we risk toppling into war. And at the very least, we will have a protracted discourse comprising extremely emotional monologues expressed by both sides. There is no common truth in this particular equation. The only way to create one is to take that block of marble and enable the emergence of the David and the Academia in Firenze. Michelangelo famously said, the sculpture is already complete within the marble block before I start my work. It is already there. I just have to chisel away the superfluous material. We actually have a pretty decent idea of what a European security architecture might look like, and it's not the product of a Yalta conference. But we have to chip away the superfluous material from the existing block. If we keep on relying on alternative realities, and the expression of divergent perspectives, we will not succeed. While all that is happening, we have fundamental challenges to representative democracy in the West as well. Nativist, populists, and anti-democrats, Papas' article on this topic in the Journal of Democracy back in 2016 is a very good introductory reference point are competing with one another to redefine national discourse in every conceivable fashion. And the level of fracture that we now see, even in countries like the United States, is probably unprecedented since the 1960s. That does not enable coherent expression of national purpose. It does not enable thoughtful expression of what might constitute transformative behavior in order to address global challenges, and it does not permit effective collective action in respect of global threats that can only be addressed on a transnational scale. Where are we? The truth is that our failure to deliver effective democracy or effective multilateral governance over two decades has led us to this point. We weaken national governments by prioritizing global financial and supply chain efficiencies and subordinating social welfare and the health of the biosphere to the economy. Citizens are upset, nativistic populism and class revolt are not surprising, and they're sharpened by conspiracy theories that are fueled by digital disinformation. So if we're going to square the circle, if we're going to unlock the David from the block of marble, we have to find a way to restore government of the people, for the people, by the people, and our ability to act collectively at the necessary scales to advance well-being, protect against disasters, and live within planetary boundaries. That tells us quite a lot. This is last night at 521. It'll be slightly different now at this moment. But broadly speaking, nearly 6 million people even by the conservative measurement that is applied in respect of COVID deaths have died from this crisis. If that is the case, how can we possibly be in the situation that we are in respect of the failure of collective action in terms of vaccine equity? That is the picture that emerged 
out of the scientific panel for the sixth review in respect of climate change last year. We're nowhere near on track where we need to be if we're not going to have the massive disruptions that are associated with the rise in temperatures above 1.5 degrees over pre-industrial levels. No capacity for collective action has been demonstrated. So how do we change? Well, one way is adaptation. And again, Dan Brooks will tell you a lot about that in due course. Changes in behavior, physiology, and structure of an organism to fit in with an environment. Organisms that have heritable traits that are well suited to a changing environment are more likely to survive and reproduce. That doesn't probably suggest that all of us will come out of this alive. We've no idea what the timescales are going to be. We've no idea what the frame and the consequences are likely to be. The second and slightly more common way of change is a paradigm shift. A fundamental change in the basic concepts and experimental practices of a scientific discipline triggered by repeated experimental anomalies inexplicable under the pre-existing paradigm. This requires scientific maturity and a new paradigm. And Thomas Kuhn's claim that paradigms are incommensurable is not applicable to the social sciences, which is a bit of a problem. But I come back to where I was at the beginning. If we don't take stock of the fact that the paradigms that we've been applying in economics and security are completely unfit for purpose, if we do not effect a paradigm shift by way of conscious decision under present circumstances, then the third way we change becomes inevitable. And that is, of course, revolution. Revolution is just a political act with a normative basis. You can think about it in whatever context you like. It doesn't always produce a better world after the revolution. It always causes a tremendous amount of social disruption in the course of it. It may, on occasion, produce a better world, but there's no guarantee of that. Clearly, if we're able, shifting our paradigms would be the preferable way of doing that. Now, shifting a paradigm involves a strategic decision. This, some of you will recognize as simply McKinsey's seven S's. It simply premises that structure and strategy and systems need to be supported by skills and style and staff, and the whole enabled by a set of shared values if you're going to act collectively, effectively at scale for advantage. But the truth is, but we've had five major extinction events in the course of the history of the planet. There are at least 25 tipping points that are pushing our oceans past the point of no return. And most of you will be familiar with the inflection points within the scales associated with climate. So unless we find a way to develop a coherent understanding of what collective action at scale involves, we shan't succeed. We have to do that at both national scales and global scales. On the national scale, we have to be realistic. And I go back here to what Professor Etel said. <laughs> Oh, excuse me, someone uh, left their mic on from the participants. Oh, I think it's okay now. Okay, thank Sorry you. about this. Not in the least. I come back to what Professor Atelier said right at the beginning um, in respect of this. The reification of truth, the objectivization of truth involves the creation of justice. The sole purpose of any government is to secure and advance the well-being of its citizens. There is no other reason for having a government. There's no other reason for paying taxes. There's no reason why a government should exist. Individuals could get on with their own lives, fight their own battles, do whatever they thought was best. We have a government because we believe that this is a process by which security and well-being will be more effectively advanced. And sovereign citizens need to demand that of their governments. We have to envision a future 
of equity, by which I mean fairness and justice, security, by which I mean chiefly human security, the ability to be able to advance and ensure one's well-being, and sustainability, which as I've suggested is just another way of thinking of intergenerational equity and intergenerational security. Envisioning that future, defining the pathways to achieving it, and using the gigantic quantum of funds that have been printed and are being monetized even as I speak to recover from this recession in order consciously to seek to create an equitable, secure and sustainable world is the task of this age. And if you can find solutions over the course of the next days to advancing that objective, you will have achieved something quite remarkable for the benefit of humanity. On a global scale, there are probably three elements that I'm encapsulating in the concept of web. The first is boundaries, neighborhoods, limits, respect and security. People tend to have walls in their houses or around their houses. They tend to have fences around gardens. We have commons and we have collective spaces, but humans seem to need a certain degree of limited boundary. So that is an element in the solution. That, however, can only succeed if it advances rights, the quality of life and permits inclusivity and enables advancement. And that must necessarily, if we are going to continue to advance, be associated with engagement across boundaries on the basis of shared norms and high cultures, and particularly the celebration of diversity and tolerance. And tolerance and tolerance in the context of disagreements. So if we can find a way to be able to balance those two elements equity, security, and sustainability as the ethos of national governance and recognition of the need to square welfare and engagement with the need for identity and boundaries at the multinational level, we might be able to extract the David from the block of marble not only in respect of a European security architecture, but also in respect of an ability to undertake collective action to address escalating risks and create additional systemic opportunity at the global level. I hope these few thoughts will trigger argument, discussion, stimulate you in a variety of different ways, and I wish you the greatest of success over the course of the whole of this winter school. Thanks very much.